If you look on the back of the bulletin, we'll find our scriptures for today. From Matthew 16 and also from Galatians 2. Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a person if they gain the whole world and forfeit themselves? Then Galatians, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if justification were through the law, then Christ died to no purpose. Word of God for the people of God. Lead to God. Let's take that last line for just a minute and look at it. I don't nullify the grace of God. It's justification through the law. If justification was through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. We talked about this in Sunday school today, and I'm sure you've talked about it often. What that's simply saying is, if all getting right with God is, is doing a bunch of regulations and good deeds, and you still don't feel anything in your heart, that's not quite enough. If you feel your heart all full of God, all full of forgiveness, all full of grace, and you do a bunch of good deeds because you now moved to do them, that's an altogether different ball game. okay? On the front of the bulletin it says, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, and he spent 40 days in the wilderness. The word 40 in Scripture is important. Uh, from time to time you'll, have, you'll see religious leaders taking a 40-day period, and Lent is a 40-day period, an opportunity for us to focus in on some really significant and some really important things, okay? Last Sunday afternoon at 2 o'clock, I went over to Christ Methodist Church to be a part of the last graduating class from the Genesis ministry there. Um, it's a bittersweet reality because that work grew out of a deep hope and dream that they had, and it went along for a while, and if I'm correct, I think 34 women have come through that program out of prison on early release and uh, through this pro program, and they have done exceedingly well. Um, they have come from one place to the other, and so many of them have been able to not only turn their lives around, but to help get other lives turned around too. Where God is going to take Wells House from the 28th of February when they hand us back the keys, um, we don't know yet, but our church will always be open to that reality. Anyway, it was both humbling and important for me to be there at the last graduating class, and they did several things. It lasted for a long time, but one of the very first graduates got up, and in the course of her talk, a little short lady, all full of spirit, said, the most difficult thing that I had to learn was to begin to think in terms of a little I and a big G. She's not the only one. When we talk about little I and big G, we talk about the perspective of our person in the place where God is. Little I, big G. What these scriptures make very clear to us is the complexity of how one lives for him or for herself. The confusion about it. Listen to this. He who seeks to save his life will lose it. But he or she that loses their lives for my sake will find it. Now, if anybody thinks that's easy, please explain it to me because I'd like to know. But there's something very important in that is in that, and it's this. If you spend your energy and your time and your effort in trying to promote yourself... You don't ever seem to get very far. And even if you do achieve in terms of how the world thinks, if you really get very far in terms of success as the world thinks, people who do it by promoting themselves still don't find the joy, the peace. That sense of purpose that other people that have much less importance, quote unquote, seem to find. So what's contained here is an extremely important spiritual dynamic. Now, I always wanted to be president of this or that along the way of my life, especially when I was in high school because I was, uh, you know, I lived, well, you don't hear about that, but anyway, I was poor and they weren't. Uh, it's not good to be at Bay St. Louis, Mississippi and be a part of the poor part, but uh, it's also growth provoking. And so, but I never got elected to anything I wanted. A couple of times I got elected to things that I knew I didn't deserve and that was sweet and nice and good. And there was this one guy and just going to use his first name, uh, his name is Billy, and he got elected to everything all the time. He was the president of this, the president of that, the head honcho, whatever. 
you know. And so one time I said to him, I said, just amazing to me. I said, you must have such ability. Uh, you must have such outstanding leadership characteristics. You always get nominated and you always get elected. And he said, sure, I get somebody to nominate me and I rig the elections. <laughs> I hope that didn't happen. I'm not sure it did. But have you ever really, listen, have you ever really wanted something so bad that you were just hoping somebody would nominate you? <laughs> I mean, really. You don't have to, if you're not there, don't, don't be false about it, you know. <laughs> but you really wanted it and you were just hoping that somebody would single you out to nominate you. Well, listen to me. You have been nominated. You have been nominated for a significant aspect of the kingdom of God. You have been nominated by God through the person of Jesus Christ for the specific purpose of, man, of bringing something of the spirit of Christ our Lord into the place where you live and work and have your being. This whole thing about losing yourself to find yourself is complex. It's not easy to understand, but it's extremely important. And I think from time to time, you might want to see how you work it out. For example, are you a putter downer? Do you find yourself putting down other people? You know, some of us do it quite out, 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 outrightly. Is that a word? Uh, outrightly. And some of us do it very subtly. You know, we put people down. But you know what we're saying when we're putting somebody else down, or somebody else's position on an issue or circumstance down? Um, we're saying about ourselves that we're pretty insecure. You see, you don't have to put somebody else down in order to lift up your conviction. On the other hand, are you a lifter-upper? There are lots of people who are lifter-uppers. Barnabas, uh, in the scriptures, was known as the son of encouragement. Wouldn't it be great for you to be a son or a daughter of encouragement? And when people look at, looked at you, they said, God, that's a person that really makes me feel more whole, more complete. They always seem to have the ability to lift me up. I'm not talking about false praise, which is for your good. I'm not talking about false stuff, you know, which is really sort of an expedient thing. You with me on that? But I'm talking about honestly feeling a need and a desire to lift the other person up. So it can be kind of complex. Well, the other thing is that self-giving is the life of the spirit in the world. If there's anything you know about God in Christ, it is that he lives in order to give, that he lives for other people. It's always funny when I'm doing a wedding and I do that little short sermon that I often do. Um, it goes like this. Lots of people think that to live is to give and to take and to have. Never has been, never will be. To live is to give and to give is to love and to love is to laugh and to suffer and sometimes to die. But to die in self-giving love is to live and that's the secret, that's the absolute secret of life in the Spirit. That in the giving of oneself, for some redemptive cause, you find life, you find life in a way that you didn't find it before. We were kidding about it last Sunday night. Uh, Here am I, Lord, send me, you know that wonderful song? And uh, somebody said that, they were singing the song, Here I am, Lord, is it I, Lord? You know that kind of thing? And, and God said, where? <laughs> Where are you? You know, that's as old as the Garden of Eden. Adam, where are you? And as modern as today, right now, where God and the Holy Spirit is saying to you, with regard to self-giving, hey, where are you? Do you know what self-giving is? It's giving yourself for those things which are good for others and good for yourself after that. When you give something that's good for others and good for yourself after that, you begin to understand the nature of Jesus when he says, Greater love hath no man than this, than that he or she lay down their life for their friends. You see, taking yourself and putting yourself there on the line for others. The gospel of the New Testament is not a gospel of self-denial in the sense that you put yourself down. It's the gospel of self-affirmation that in your investment you find yourself strengthened and made a lot, lot stronger in the inner person along the way. And then finally, love is a call beyond oneself. I like to think of these passages of Scripture, each one of them as a kind of call from God uh, to you, from God to me, that says, hey, you want fulfillment, you want joy, you want peace, you want uh, to celebrate your existence. I always think of Tony Campolo. He said, most people think of the church as a dismal place for mourning. He said, the church ought to be a party. Uh, the kingdom of God ought to be a party. It ought to be a celebration. And I agree with that 100%. Uh, incidentally, many of you know the story, but I've just got to tell it to you because it's so perfect. About one of Campolo's best-known stories about a prostitute 
that worked a certain area in New York, and Campolo had gone in there for supper, and all these girls were over there talking, and this one girl named Agnes said it was her birthday, and everybody said, big deal. And she went out to do her work on the street, and Campolo said, is she one of the girls? And the bar tender cook said yes. And he said, he, the preacher, said, let's throw her a party. And the bartender said, what? He said, throw her a party. So they threw her a birthday party the next night. They came in around the same time every night. And they had a cake and lots of things. And the girl took the cake with tears in her eyes and said, I've never had a birthday party. Could I go and show this cake to my mama? She said, it's just a few blocks away. She went away and she came back and then the girls ate and went back out to the night. And the bartender said, what are you? And Tony Campolo said, what do you mean? He said, are you religious or a preacher or something? And Campolo said, well, yeah, I happen to be a Christian Baptist preacher. And said, well, what kind of church do you serve? And he said, the kind of church that throws birthday parties for whores. And the man behind the counter said, wow, I could be a part of a church like that. The intention is not vulgarity, beloved. The intention is that the kingdom of God should break into our experience to free us to do what the world won't do for those for whom nobody will do a dead gum thing. Thank you for being a part of that. There is, in this very congregation, at this very time, at least one person, unknown to you all, who is a bone marrow donor. If that's not a piece of oneself for the good of another, even an unknown other. Did you read about it in the Clarion Ledger not too very long ago? It's been maybe a year or so about the unrelated person that offered one of their kidneys to someone they came to know. I'm not asking you to go out and give bone marrow or donate a kidney, but I am asking what in the world is it that possesses a human being to say, I'll take a piece of me for the good of someone else. Why, it's almost like Jesus saying, if I have to go to some Calvary's cross, then I'll go. Because it's for the good of someone else. Then the little I in big G does the strangest thing of all. The Holy Spirit of God speaks to you, speaks to me, and says, well, I make your little I big I. May that happen to each and in and through each of us. Amen. Let us pray. You know, God, sometimes the gospel breaks in as a very pleasant surprise and sometimes as a pretty radical opening of ourselves to you. It's very easy for us to point our fingers to the well-known other people who need you so much. But it's something else when the finger gets pointed to us and says, hey, are you willing to make yourself little in order to make someone else big? Because if you do, I'll give you status and place like you've not known before. We won't do it for that cause, God. We'll just do it and trust you for the outcome. Help us to understand something of what that means during these days of Lent. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.